this is uh, Frederick Vogelberg. <laughs> um, he's been a uh, long CETA member um, by many years. And of course, he's an expert uh, in organizational psychology and will be talking about this very yeah, um, interesting topic today. So, and I am part of the um, events and committee, um, uh, events and membership committee of CETA Europa, and also the CETA Europa um, general secretary. And um, I'd like to tell you, all the participants, that you are um, unmuted. There will be times when we unmute you so that you can speak or ask questions but um, most of the time you are invited to um, to um, ask uh, questions in the chat box that you can see uh, down on, on the list or in the Q&A session there's a possibility to raise hands and uh, to ask questions so yeah. this webinar will also be recorded and uh, the link is going to be provided on the YouTube channel of CETA Europa. So, yeah, and I hand over to Frederick. To say thank you, Saskia. Thank you. thank you, Saskia, for organizing it. What is the yellow thing behind you in your picture? Uh, it's welcome. a lamp, actually, yes. <laughs> it's a lamp, okay. <laughs> and I thought I'd choose a picture that shows me facilitating. Uh, in a traditional way, in the meeting room, because I also do that, apart from Ah, okay. Yeah. Old-fashioned with flip charts and the meeting room and so on. Okay, welcome everybody. We have 49 people, 47 participants. So great that you are willing to make the time on this uh, afternoon, which is rainy here in the Netherlands, where I am. And looking forward to spend an hour with you. This is another self-portrait, uh, the advantage of doing, uh, uh, working virtually. Uh, spending an hour with you on the topic of leadership of global teams, globally dispersed teams, remote teams, virtual teams, whatever you want to call them. And I see some old friends on the participant list, and so that's great. What are we going to do? And a little check-in, even though there's... Uh, a lot of us. I do want to do a little bit of experimenting today. This is a group of peers, so we can, um, we don't need to play it safe. We can uh, try out some stuff, I think. So let's have some fun together. And then <coughs> um, sharing um, get, uh, focus activities, so actually getting the group uh, together as a learning group. <coughs> um, try to build a little bit of inclusion over distance. How do you do that in an hour with 51, uh, 52 people? Um, some content for you about how, what I see, what I think about leadership of remote teams. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is not cooperating. And then uh, comp something on leadership competencies before we check out. A, if you have questions, and um, you can use the chat at any time and you can also uh, use the Q&A. Saskia is monitoring the uh, Q&A function and the chat, you can send as many chats as you like. Actually, as a little bit of practice, let's um, get engaged and say something. Rika, you already said uh, hello from Madrid. Julia has said hello. Anna has said good, uh, so let's greet each other. Maybe you know some friends here. Wow, look at that. From Amman, from Poland, Berlin, all over the place. Great, nice to see you all. And I think one of the aspects of remote leadership is that you need to work on including people. So how do you do that? A lot of virtual communication is so boring. Webinars tend to be so boring. So what I'm trying to practice here today is to practice inclusion and engagement. Um, Netiquette, how do we work together this afternoon or this morning if you are in Toronto or in Toronto? 
Um, you are muted, but we're going to have one activity where everybody's unmuted. And you are also welcome to um, unmute yourself or ask Saskia to help you with that. Then uh, you use the chat box actively. If you're bored, you know, use the chat or the Q&A instead of going to your emails. It's much more fun to stay in the session and engage. And Seske, if you can, if you can figure it out, give people the annotation, right, so they can draw on the screen. But first, let's get present and let's get focused. So you, you've probably all had a busy Monday uh, behind you, or maybe you're in the middle of your busy Monday and other activities. So one of the things with about remote leadership is when you communicate with the global team is to get people focused. So let's do a little bit of that. And I'd like you to focus on your body to make sure that you sit comfortably in your seats. And Sunita has just had dinner, so maybe you're digesting your dinner. Sit comfortably in your seat and make sure your back is straight. You have a straight spine and without feeling tense or stiff. And roll your shoulders a little bit uh, up and back and down and forward a couple of times. And make sure that your feet are comfortably on the ground. So your feet firmly on the ground your knees at a 90 degree angle and your hands on your legs and an active active position it's good for your back we sit too much behind our computer screens and roll your head a couple of times in the back of your neck and forward and to the left and to the right and take a deep breath as well so take this moment to focus on yourself. Even though we are in a group here of 51 people, a huge distance between us, we are, we are still together this one hour as a remote group, a group sharing a common interest. So we are connected despite the difference. And to experience that connectedness, I would like you first to take a few breaths and just focus on yourself. So just observe your breath a couple of times, breathing in and breathing out. Nothing active, just observing your breath, helping you to take a bit of distance from the day behind you, the evening ahead. And just enjoy this moment with yourself. You've taken this hour in your agenda to spend some time with other CETA members who share an interest in this topic. So just feel the connection and enjoy this moment that you have taken for yourself. Maybe as you do this, maybe the thoughts about the day everything you've done, everything that's still in your to-do list, your worries and concerns, maybe they come, and if they come, you just let them go again. You watch them, but you don't attach yourself to them. And another deep breath to enjoy the moment. And as you're feeling comfortable, and relax a little bit and manage perhaps to slow down. You imagine all your CETA friends and colleagues who are with you in this session from all over the world, stretching from India to Europe to Canada, maybe a lot of other countries around and in between, and you feel the connection despite the physical distance. And then it's time to bring your attention 
back to the session, back to the screen. And let me take you through some of the activities that uh, I have in mind for this afternoon. And the topic of today is about leadership skills, in particular leading remote teams, reading globally. I'm give you, going to give you a little bit of content, not too much, because it often gets quickly gets boring and we often quickly get distracted in webinars. So a little bit and then I'll give you a chance to respond through chat or Q&A. And so feel free to interact if you want. So what do we know about global leadership? And by global leadership, I mean leaders who manage across cultural, geographical borders, time zones, and who manage people who are not in the same building together. So we know that virtual teams, remote teams can actually be very effective. They can be do better than co-located teams. So maybe we now as a learning group, this very moment, maybe we can be even more effective than if we were sitting in a conference room together. And the statistics of the, the little research that there is, and there is not so much, says that most virtual teams are not successful, actually about one third only. So they can be successful, but it's, it's quite hard. So what, is, what does a remote leader look like? I think she or he looks like this, like an octopus. What do we know about remote leadership? I uh, found a nice, nice video clip. I'm not going to show it to you now, even though it should be able on this, possible in this technology. But um, if you're interested, check him out on YouTube. He's a British CEO of an IT company. His name is Neil Gandhi. Oops. And let me see if I can write that for you. Neil Gandhi, annotation. Here we go. I don't know if you all can write. But if you, if you, Saskia has given you the rights, you are welcome to scribble. Neil Gandhi says, he talks about the amplification principle, saying that leadership skills get amplified. A good manager becomes better and a bad manager becomes worse. And there's a nice, as I said, if you Google it on uh, you, or if you look for it on YouTube, Neil Gandhi, remote leadership, you will find, um, a short interview with him about it. And what does, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Let's see here if I can do that. Let me see. Now I'm stuck. Zoom. Let's see here. Saskia, can you help me getting to the next slides? Do you know how that suddenly stopped doing it for me? Ah, here we go. I think we can go back to all whole screen. Here we go. Yeah. And um, what Lena Gretton from London School of Economics also says, it's more complicated to lead across to your graphical distance is actually more challenging than leading a collocated team. So question to you in the chat, can you mention one important competency that you think is important for the leader of a global team? So let us know in the chat. 11 responses coming in. Communication, says Julia. Oh my goodness. Communication skills, patient, intercultural competence. Yeah, we know about that at CTR. I see a lot of communication skills. I see trust. I see written communication. Uh, moderation, so yeah, facilitation of meetings. 
Dimitris, organizational skills, building a team, relationship building. Yeah, so I see a lot of people type skills, clear roles, comfort with technology. Great. Yeah, let's look at some of those things that you mentioned. I think you deserve a chocolate for your amazing contributions. And Christina says tolerant. Yeah. So let's look at these competencies. How, what do they look like? Um, some of you referred to this, uh, building a remote uh, team. How, what, is it, what does it look like? And I think one important aspect is inclusion, making people feel included, even though they are thousands of kilometers away, which is what I'm trying to do with you now, at least to some extent with a, with a group of 55 to include you. So we're going to do a little experiment here in inclusion. It's the first time I'm doing this, so don't kill me if it doesn't work. Uh, we're going to sing together as a virtual group of 55 people. So Saskia, are you able to unmute everybody? See if we can sing as a, re as a remote choir. And I'm sure we'll hear if it happens. We should all be unmuted. Can we hear something? I hear you, Saskia, but I don't hear 53 people around the globe. <laughs> hmm. What's there? Can people unmute themselves? Can anyone try? Tell us in the chat how it's going. It doesn't look Saskia, like people are able to unmute themselves. No, Do you have any, so. you have any other tricks? Yeah, go ahead. Try to unmute them all. So people don't unmute me. I'm on the bus. Okay. <laughs> Is this working? Not yet. I cannot hear anyone. Julia can't. Oh, people are afraid. People are on the bus or in the office, so they they don't want to sing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, shall we? Do you want to try and we come back to this later? Yes, we do. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because otherwise, you and I could just sing for the whole group. <laughs> but, okay. This this is by the way. This is the. This is a song here. Okay. Um, I think most of us know it. Kinga, there's nothing wrong with singing on the bus. I think it's absolutely legitimate. Maybe the other passengers will sing it on. So if if Saskia figures out the unmuting, we'll come back to it later. All right, so be be prepared at any moment. Some of you mentioned the uh, smart use of technology. Obviously, the, that is an important leadership competency. And I say smart use because you don't have to be a wizard. You just have to be comfortable with the, the technology that your organization or that your team is using. Um, any questions on technology? Saskia, are you seeing the Q&A function? <coughs> Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions on technology? No, what we yes. shall sing and uh, if it's, yeah. Have you ever, Heike, have you ever attended a webinar where everything went <laughs> smoothly? Okay. Yeah, a lot of boring webinars go smoothly just because they, the presenters control everything. And they put people on mute. Like now, they don't interact with people. So they basically use just do a monologue. And then people tend to disconnect after three minutes because it's you, you can't do monologues in webinars. And as soon as you start including people, being more inclusive, um, you need to take a bit of risk and let go of the, uh, the, the control and make it more interactive. <coughs> And it does have to do with group size 
up to, up to 12 uh, you can keep um, everything open you can keep audio open and you can give people all the all the rights to do everything they want on the screen and with larger groups you have to do a little bit uh, build a little bit of control and Tani, by the way, Saskia, Tanya says that we can hear you typing. <coughs> Is that... Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, what are typical challenges for remote leaders? What do you think, um, from your experience as professionals, what do they find challenging? Can we see some responses in the chat, please? Here's the trust again. I'm Julia, who gets extra chocolate for being a very active participant. Keeping people on board, yeah, that's the inclusion piece. Silent participants. Uh, yeah, getting connected. So it's a lot about inclusion, engagement, and connection. And can we, I wanted to comment on one of you. And uh, there's so much contribution. Yeah, great. Um, and uh, Rana, you said, you mentioned, can you please put us back on mute? I don't think you were unmuting. And then you make an interesting comment. You say that so that we don't accidentally interrupt. I believe in, 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 interruptions i think um as a remote leader when you manage a virtual team you need to allow for that degree of uh, spontaneity and if and i think interrupting uh, is about responding spontaneously which is what people do in normal teams in co-located teams so why not in uh, remote teams um from our training with remote leaders, I've collected here a few um, comments, just a few from many, that I find interesting. You know, what, what do these people find difficult? Um, not being able to see how the member is doing, and no physical direct contact with people. Out of sight, out of mind. Often, and perhaps this is your experience too. People who manage remotely, they manage, they are in multiple teams. We're often team members also who are in a global team. They're, they're part of multiple project teams, for instance. So it is tough for them to get people identified, you know, with a specific team. And uh, that the thing of losing the relationship, keeping connected. And some of you mentioned that in the in the chat in the chat. Um, some of the chat trust. So many of you talked about trust, and this is a very common one. Have Have you been there that in a virtual meeting um, that the leader or the chairwoman or man the chairperson says, you know, we have such a large agenda. Let's not waste our time. Let's go straight to the to-do list. And people skip the relationship piece, which and most of your comments were about relationships. And somehow, uh, remote leaders they tend to forget about that. They tend to devote their meetings to the task and to the to-do list only. And they think, you know what, we'll do the relationship piece. We'll do that in four months when we meet for our annual meeting. So, and by then the team is, is disengaged and maybe on its way to conflict. Some of you talked in the chat about silent participants and harder to deal with conflicts. What, do you, what, what is your view on conflicts in remote teams? Any experience with that or any views on that? How is it different from 
co-located teams. I'm looking forward to some chat comments again. No open co conflicts, Yvonne says. Email, yes, huge source of, source of misunderstanding. I see a lot of comments about conflicts remaining under the surface, misinterpretations, irritations are not being addressed and linger. And remember the magnifying principle that I talked about earlier, uh, small irritations can blow up to become big conflicts much quicker. So one ta task of the remote leader is to defuse conflict at a very early stage and to be sensitive to what is under the surface, the small irritations that linger and to deal with them and to address with them on top of the cross-cultural aspect of conflict and misunderstandings. This is a, this is a graph about the task versus the relationship. It comes from Ghislaine Collat, by the way, from Ashridge uh, Business School. She says that a team, a, a virtual team can only be a high performing team if you focus on both the task and the relationship, if you manage to integrate them. And a remote team that is only task focused will not be able to deal with more complex tasks. They will just remain on the surface and deal with information sharing, but not getting into real dialogue, um, creating stuff for solving complex problems, learning, being creative. Okay, speaking of relationships, um, so how do you do that as a remote leader? How do you build that into a team that is thousands of kilometers apart? Um, one simple little trick is what we call the water cooler moment. So let's have a water cooler moment now. A two minute chat. Go over the participant list. You can pull down the participant list. See if there's anyone you know, an old friend that maybe you have met at a CETA conference. And have a private chat with that person. If you see the chat box, you will see that there is the opportunity for public chats. It goes to everyone and for private chats. So select the private chat. Tanya says you don't see the participant list. If you go to the top of your screen with your mouse, this, you pull down a little black menu bar, at least on my screen. On the right hand side, there's three dots that say more. And if I go there, I can choose chat, invite, um, and participant screen. All right, it's actually more to the left. I have a mute button, I have a participant button. And if you can't find the private chat, you send you have a water cooler moment with the whole group. So what would you normally say at the water cooler? Ah, you don't have any of these options, but you are allowed to chat. Thank God you are allowed to chat. Saskia, can you give people access to private chat or is it? only for us. And I think the water cooler moment is over. Anyway, just to give you ideas of the kind of things you can do in large groups virtually to get people engaged. So what are some, of, some more challenges? A lot of people that we have trained, a lot of remote leaders, they talk about performance management. So they say, you know, it's so tough to control. And how do I know, you know, if my employees are on time at work and if they do what I ask them to do? So that's one thing. 
Um, so we talk, we need to talk to them about performance management. A common idea of task, you, you talked about that in the chat and the alignment. Um, so some managers talk about control and some talk about the advantage. They say, I actually, I like it because I find it much easier to delegate because I, I can't control my remote team members anyway, anyway so I'm, it's easier for me to delegate. Somebody said something in the chat about the water cooler, about me being Dutch. I'm only partly Dutch, by the way. Is it typical Dutch to... Um, Nanette, you really want a water cooler moment because you're thirsty. So feel free to step out and go to your own water cooler. Somebody says it's only for presenters. No, the water cooler is for everyone. If you're thirsty, go and get something to drink. Okay. Um, in our team, we've, we've published an article on uh, remote leadership. And what we found partly from practice, our own practice and partly from the literature, we find a number of competencies that remote leaders need to be good at in order to be effective. So we've, we have a bit of time left. Um, let's have a little bit of audience participation. Which of the other competencies would you like to look at now? And you can select from any of the red um, uh, the red ones that I marked through the red tick. So let us know in the chat which of these competencies you'd like to talk more about. As I thought maybe not about, yeah, managing growth across cultures, Nanette. I think I think that is so familiar to all of us here. So I thought maybe about something else. Um, Saskia, is it possible to, to unmute individuals? I'm getting really bored listening to my own voice. Or can we not do that? I think building trust is the, is the winner. Unfortunately, no. Uh, I think it's uh, possible beforehand, but yeah. We couldn't do that. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's possible, but you said, sorry, I wasn't, I didn't hear your call. I think you have to edit that beforehand. Ah, uh, okay. Because it's very okay. different to the meetings we, we used to have on Zoom. Okay. So we, you and I will just have to sing together, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was really looking forward to this virtual choir across continents, yeah. but some other time. Invite me back. Okay, let's look at the trust building because I think that was got maximum votes. And yeah, what does Dilbert say here? Um, you need to have a bit of trust for your employees. So, um, what have we found out about trust in virtual space? Um, here are the things that contribute to trust uh, virtually. And I'm not going to read it out to you because you can read it yourself. High context. Yeah, trust from the start. It's called swift trust in the literature. So for some reason in virtual sp space, people tend to trust each other more easily uh, from the onset to, to give other team members the benefit of the of the doubt. And what does it say here? Virtual presence. Yeah. How do you how do you think you create presence when people are thousands of miles? How can you somehow be present in the other team members' mind 
Um, any ideas about that in the chat? Yeah, Joyce, we can see what you type. Yes. So how do you build how do you build a virtual presence when your team is dispersed? Anything happening in the chat? Yeah. Share people sharing something about themselves. Yes. Technology. Yeah, the apps. Rika, you, you mentioned the apps. I see a lot of remote teams doing that. They use chat, simple chats like WhatsApp. Uh, to stay connected through through short messages, just as a lot of young people do. Um, even a voice is amazing. Rika, what do you mean by, by that comment? Uh, chat rooms, yes. And Rana, where, where's our part of the world? What's the groups? Uh, what is E O R L? Arab oil, ah, <laughs> okay. Which part of the Arab world? Yeah, I see a lot of comments about uh, chat rooms and so on. Um, a lot of our clients, large organizations nowadays use Link, Microsoft Link, also known as Skype for Business. Are you all familiar with that? And what Link offers, okay, I can show you. I can share my screen. Let's say if I have link open. No, this is Skype. Okay, I'll go to my desktop. Let's see for those of you who are not familiar with link, if I can show that. Link is a chat tool and it looks like this. Can you see it? And it enables you to, to keep you can keep it open and here are three three are my frequent contact and if you chat to somebody you kind of have it on your desk and it stays there and it's like almost like being in the same room with somebody like uh, i'm going to get coffee or what's happening at your end it's a nice little chat tool and most of our i would say most of our corporate clients or organizational clients they they use that so um i hear that that is a good way to keep virtual presence and another thing of course is to show interest in people um anna you you are using slack can you tell us a little bit more about slack i'm really sorry we can't unmute you but can you say a little bit about Slack in the chat box so the other participants can see? Sounded like a doorbell ringing. Ah, it's a Q&A. Tanya is the is saying, okay, about the weekend and the film. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of virtual presence going on in this session right now. You see, people are communicating informally, written. So even without the audio, we can still have that engagement, that virtual presence that contributes to trust. So that brings me back to trust. So extra antennae, uh, because, the, because of the irritations that you mentioned, and the looming conflict under the surface. Leaders of remote teams, they need to, to have that sensitivity to pick up what is not being spoken, what is said be behind the lines. And I think there's a connection between that competency and the high context communication. So I, I say if, if what, we, what we as interculturalists are teaching people, about high and low context that is helpful in order to diffuse conflict as well. Okay, diffuse it early. That is 
rather than let it explode in your face. And um, I've had I've had that experience with the group that there was some misunderstandings and irritations, and it really blew up very very quickly. So you need to go over there. This is one of my favorite models of trust. If you like models, um, anybody familiar with the David Meister trust equation? Have you seen that? And if so, what do you th what do you think of it? Uh, Vinita says so often hard to interpret what is under the surface. Yes. Anybody else worked with the this model, the Meister trust equation? Okay. What Tanya has worked with it. Okay. Compared to other trust models, I think the added the added piece is under the under the under the line here, the self orientation, right? A lot of other uh, models talk about what's over the line, so the, the, your credibility, your competence as a professional. You know, are you seen as credible? Reliability: Do you do what you promise? Do you deliver on time? And if you can't make a deadline, do you communicate about it? And the social aspect, do you actually, you know, are you, are you a person who enjoys being with other people and connecting with other people? The social aspect. Those you find in most trust models. And I think what David Meister adds is the self-orientation. That you can be, you can have a high score on all of these three, but if your self-orientation is high, the, the trustworthiness is, is low nevertheless. So this, uh, I think, is a model that is very useful. Caroline likes it for raising awareness of intercultural cultural interpretation. And it works very well when you teach remote leadership skills as well. What do you mean by self-orientation, as uh, Emily? Um, Maybe, Carolyn, can you explain it in the chat? I'll give you a break from listening to my voice after 43 minutes. And see if Caroline, Caroline explains it to Emily. Self-orientation. Caroline, I, I can't see if you're writing. Can you give a signal if you're, yeah, here we go. Okay, several responses. More I than we, I think that's a beautiful summary. Adrienne, I couldn't have said it more succinctly. And Tiagi expresses his self-interest. Yes, David Meister talks about, you know, focus on your own goals or your own agendas rather than the common interest of the team or the organization. But I like the more I than we. So I guess it's connected to individualism and collectivism. How you focus, exactly, perception of how you focus on yourself and others. Does it help, Emily? Did you get your question answered? If not, knock on the door. Super, okay. Um, a few words about conflict. There's not that much research about conflict in remote teams. So it's it's um, the whole thing with remote teams. If you dive into the research, you see that it's a young uh, area, which means that you find a lot of contradictory statements. Um, you know, some people say about trust, or some people, some researchers say, that remote teams should focus on relationship to start with. And other researchers and publishers say that they should start with the task first. So um, you need to find your way in the dark a little bit about this. Conflict can be easier to avoid. Yes. Ghislaine Kola, I quoted her earlier. She says that every meeting, even a phone call or a phone conference of a remote team, it does not have a relationship component is one step on, on the way to conflict. 
And so postponing the relationship building is is always bad, she says. And the Yohari window. Thank you for that, Dimitris. Um, what have we found about um, managing conflict in remote teams? It's a bunch of rules here. Um, like in, I would say, high-performing teams, traditional high-performing teams, the making the implicit explicit is always helpful. And as, as you know, as interculturalists. So uh, what are our rules? What are our assumptions? You know, is, is it okay to disagree or not? Um, can we give each other feedback? Uh, what, what is constructive feedback? And how are we going to deal with this? So a bit of time on making things explicit and, um, and creating some rules around it. Okay, um, I'm moving on to another competency, which is performance management. Not many of you actually mentioned it, uh, but a, lo a lot of managers, as you will recognize, are, are heavy on control and uh, authority. Just re recently we had a French HR director who was moved from headquarters in Paris to a regional role in uh, China. And she screamed of frustration. She said, I know all my life I've been used to check if my, my team is there at 8.30 sharp. And now these people are all over the, the continent. They are from Korea to New Zealand to India. And I have no clue whether they're, uh, they are performing or not. So letting go of control and moving to a more delegation, more participative style of management is a, is a big challenge for many leaders. So if you work with remote leaders, that is definitely something that you need to help with them. And Rika, thank you, by the way, for mentioning the team charter. And I find it's often very tough to get a team's attention to that. To think, yeah, yeah, we need a charter, and then they see it as a, as a bit of a waste of time, and then they stumble afterwards. But I think there, there, there is a lot of resemblance between um, any cross-cultural team many of us work with and and uh, and remote remote is just one more layer of complexity in an intercultural team that sounds very pessimistic but then remember the optimistic message that some virtual teams are much more effective than some co-located teams okay let's look at performance management for a few minutes because i promised it to you and uh, what are some of the differences between a face-to-face -face team, there's less control. You can see if people are in the office. And how do you track performance? How do you know if people have done something that you asked them to do? Um, hey, we're back to trust. So you see at the heart of this model, you see trust is back, back in town. There's no trust, no performance management. So you have to trust your team members. Um, so less control means more delegation. And this is another important factor. It means switching from input, so how many hours does somebody put in to output. Sometimes in my work as executive coach, I think, well, that, that's what we've been doing for many years, you know, managing based on output, but I still encounter Many, many managers who like to manage input, you know, hours in the office or, you know, uh, working late or sending apps late at night, sending emails late at night. Maybe that's my cultural bias. Um, so, particularly leaders who, who like control, who use a lot of control and who manage on input and who maybe not trusting by nature they need to develop a virtual way of working and managing performance. And 
um, to, to have a deep think about trust. This was mentioned by some of you earlier when I, in the chat when I talked about, when we talked about competencies. Okay, um, how are we doing? Saskia, any questions coming up in the Q&A? Not so far. No, I think people, are, people love using the chat, so there's a lot yes. of chat. <laughs> Good, then um, it says, what does it say here? Commercial break, oh wow. Um, I just wanted to show you how we, t how we in, in our company, how we train these type of skills and competencies that we have been looking at. And here you'll see some of the competencies coming back, uh, like performance management, building a team, using the technology, Here's the technology, oops, and the, the trust, the trust and conflicts. So we do that in two hour sessions, totally virtual, and we give participants a lot of practice. So we actually give them the, we let them facilitate uh, part of the session so they get the practice too. So that's how we train these skills and maybe that's how you do it also in your, practices. By the way, we also have a train the trainer, train the online trainer. So if you deliver a lot of virtual sessions or webinars, your clients are asking you to do that, you might be interested in our program, train the online trainer. It looks like this, eight session of two hours spread over eight weeks. And this starts the next one Next open enrollment starts in September. So maybe it's something you want to treat yourself to after the summer. Um, if, with the team, we wrote a book called Live Connections, which is a handbook for virtual facilitators like yourselves. So if you lead a lot of meetings, virtual meetings, virtual training sessions, um, group sessions, you might be interested in this um, book. Some of you might already have it. And drop me a mail if you want to make use of the discounts for CETA members. And then that leaves us some time for questions. Ah, we haven't done the singing together. Saskia, do you want to sing or the two, the two of us together or leave it? <laughs> If they really want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people start to run off. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it looks like it. Yes, Sunita, thank you for the nice feedback on the book. Um, this, is, this has been a very, very short overview. At the end, I'm going to send you, we're going to send you um, an article, um, which the slides are based on the article of the seven competencies. And it gives you a little more than the slide pack. Saskia, if I send the article to you, can oh, you yeah. distribute yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Um, it's been very compact, this session. Thank you, Thomas. Anybody wants to know anything else? Oh, gosh. We have some users of the book here. That's great. You're welcome, Ote. Bye, Anna, and I hope to hear all your voices next time. That would be great. Um, the, the article is on the way to all of you. And yes, we will, send, uh, we will send the article to you, and uh, as soon as the recording is online, you can get the link to the YouTube channel and of course uh, the slides so you will be informed. The next webinar is taking place on the 21st of July and um, yeah we hope to welcome you there again. It's going to take place in the morning at 10 o'clock so maybe for those <laughs> um, who stay in other parts of the world welcome you there. And say thank you. For those of you who are still here, maybe write one word in the chat to um, if you learned something new. 
just to see what was uh, what was new information for you, or not just content, but also maybe on the on the process. Is there anything new that you learned? Or has everybody gone already? Let's see if we can find the participant lists, the chocolate slide, and the focus activity. Great. Yeah, and I hope my message got across that it cannot be too structured. If you want people to engage in a remote team as a leader, as a facilitator, you need to allow for a little bit bits of spontaneity and let go of, of too much structure. Yeah, thank you, Christine. The risking, yeah. Inclusion, great. Sounds like everybody got something, one new idea, and that's not bad. One new, one new thing from a one hour session. Yeah, thinking by yourselves. Yeah. That's what remote leaders need to do, Manon. That's why I do it. And a lot of leaders, they tend to kill the engagement by taking too much air time and only one voice. Okay, oh, look at that. Some, what a fabulous comments all of you. It's not, it's not really tulip time, but I thought I'd send you a bunch of tulips from um, Amsterdam anyway. Kiitos. Uh, kiitos sinulle, Birgit. Oli kiva nähdä. You are welcome, Yoshiko. Okay, that's it, folks. Um, for those of you who want to chat and stay here, you're welcome for another water cooler moment. Otherwise, I wish you a very nice evening, afternoon wherever you are and hope to see you in the next webinar or at the next CETA Europa conference next year in Ireland.